So thanks, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, the, the, in this talk, uh, I'll try to describe some new ideas in uh, quantum field theory and their mathematical origin, and then apply those uh, new techniques in some particular example, which is uh, the sorry the dynamics of uh, QCD with uh, adjoint uh, met adjoint fermions in two plus one dimensions. So what I'll do is uh, to first present a solution, so at least a, pr a proposed solution. So I'll propose a solution for this uh, strongly coupled quantum field theory using the various new techniques that uh, have been devised and elaborated upon in various literature that I'll quote. And then, we'll actually, and then I'll actually talk a little bit about four-dimensional QCD, and we'll see that these ideas have quite interesting implications for uh, questions about four-dimensional uh, young mills theory that uh, have been uh, open for a little bit. So the talk will consist of, of these two, two, two different uh, parts, where first we'll discuss uh, some new methods in two plus one dimensional theories. We'll propose a solution to QCD, non supersymmetric QCD, with adjoint fermions, and then we'll talk about three plus one dimensions. So uh, recently there has been uh, a lot of uh, work on uh, quantum field theory, uh, <coughs> revisiting some old questions in quantum field theory. Uh, here I'm not going to attempt to give an overview of uh, the various uh, new results and techniques. Uh, rather what I'll do is to focus on uh, one particular example, which is the example I mentioned. And we will uh, uncover some of the ideas that have been recently employed in using that one example as a toy model, so to speak. So, and the presentation is mostly based on a paper with Zhao Megomis and Nathan Seiberg, as well as some work in progress. But at some point, so I will also use some previous results uh, from another paper with David Agayoto, Anton Kapustin, and Nathan Seiberg. But most of the presentation is based on, most of the presentation is based on uh, the paper with Zhao Men, Gomez and Nayan Cyberg, and the other half of the presentation, or a little bit less than a half, is based on some work that has not been published yet. Okay, so first terminology. I'll be using this terminology quite extensively. So just to uh, make sure that everybody is on the same page. Uh, sorry, when I will use the phrase trivial gap uh, for a certain vacuum in quantum field theory. By that, I mean that the wave function is approximately a direct product, and uh, there are no massless particles, and there are also no topological uh, degrees of freedom. So the partition functions of such theories are not very interesting. They're, they're, these are also known as invertible field theories. They could be even trivial invertible field theories in condensed matter physics. The next type of vacuum that we will encounter is when you have a topological field theory. So the theory has some enyans, uh, which can even be measured by their Aharonov bond phases at very low energy, at very low energies, but there are no massless excitations. And then there could be massless phases. These are phases where you have a genuine conformal field theory. So it's like a second order, a second order phase transitions or a phase, second order phase transition or a quantum phase transition. And, uh, these massless phases could also be accompanied by a non-trivial topological field theory. So there could be a mixture between the third and the second type of phases. So this is the terminology. And we'll uh, study in detail this one example here. This example is very rich. It presents uh, questions about confinement, uh, questions about symmetry breaking, questions about the uh, topological field theories. So the example that we will study is SUN gauge theory in two plus one dimensions coupled to a single Majorana fermion in the adjoint representation. And in two plus one dimensions, you can also write a churn simons term. So there will be some churn simons term at level K. So our theory is going to be labeled by a few integers and the mass of that fermion. So let's write, this is the Lagrangian. So here we can see the various labels. So we have an SUN gauge field. We have a Chern-Simons term at level K. 
and we have a fermion in the adjoint representation of mass m. So the theory is basically labeled by the mass, by k, and by the rank of the group. In two plus one dimensions, the mass is a real parameter. That's because our fermion is a Majorana fermion, so the mass has to be a real parameter. And there is an important consistency condition, which is that n over, if n is odd, k has to be a half integer, and if n is even, k has to be an integer. This is just for the well-definedness of this theory. So this is an important consistency condition to keep in mind on these various parameters. So uh, the, the idea, the, the, main, the main question here is to solve this model. So this is a non-supersymmetric non model of a, a strongly coupled model of the gauge fields interacting with adjoint fermions. And we'll basically throw at it all the tools that we know and we'll try to present the solution. And somehow, miraculously, uh, we could find a solution to this model, meaning we could find a, a suggestion that makes sense for the bucket structure. That's typically extremely hard. But for this particular example, we were somewhat lucky. So what can we say about the dynamics of uh, QCD in two plus one dimensions? So there is an interesting special case, which is when n is even. Uh, as you remember, when n is even, we are allowed to set k to zero. And then we are also allowed to pick the mass to vanish. We can take the mass to be vanishing. And in that case, the theory has time reversal symmetry. So that's like the closest to what you might call QCD. That's, uh, that's if you just say QCD without extra, extra uh, labels, that's what you might mean. So this is a time reversal invariant the of theory of gauge fields interacting with adjoint fermions. And there is a deep observation that I will now review, which is that this time reversal symmetry even though it's a good symmetry that acts on the Hilbert space, it cannot be consistently gauged. So by gauging time reversal symmetry, you really mean that you can try to put the theory in a non-orientable space. And there is an obstruction for putting this theory in a non-orientable space, very much like what my son uh, Barkeshli was talking about yesterday, but not quite the same. And uh, this, this obstruction will have various implications for the possible infrared behavior of this gauge theory. So let me review this obstruction. You can think about this obstruction for putting this time reversal invariant theory on a non-orientable space as a sort of a Toft anomaly. And there is an argument in condensed matter physics and later by Ed Witten that this anomaly is valued in Z16. And if you want to understand the origin of this mod 16, you can look at this paper of Ed Witten for an explanation. And in this, an important observation is that if you have a single Majorana fermion, no charges under anything, just a single Majorana fermion, it contributes to this anomaly 1 mod 16. So we can try to, this anomaly is typically denoted by nu, by the letter nu. So this adjoint QCD model has such an anomaly for time reversal symmetry at k equals 0 and m equals 0, and when n is even. And it's straightforward to compute it. We simply count the number of fermions mod 16. So this takes either of the two possible values, 3 and minus 1, mod 16, for n, which is 0 mod 4, or 2 mod 4. So just this little fact that this model cannot be consistently put on a non-orientable space leads to interesting constraints for the infrared dynamics of QCD. So it's a, it is, in fact, sufficient to make this observation to rule out the trivial gaps vacuum. So surprisingly, somewhat surprisingly, 2 plus 1 dimensional pure QCD with an adjoint fermion cannot be in a trivial gap vacuum. You might recall that the corresponding theory in 3 plus 1 dimensions does have trivial gap vacuum. But in 2 plus 1 dimensions, that's impossible. And we will see that we need to match these anomalies in the full sense of anomaly matching. And there, will, there are various options. This does not look very constraining because there are many ways in which you could soak up that anomaly. You could have a TQFT, you could have some uh, massless uh, fields. There are still many options, and this observation is not sufficient, but it's important to keep in mind. And a new tool that we will use, which was uh, developed recently in the literature, to further constrain the possible dynamics of this theory is, the, is what people call the one-form symmetry, which is basically the statement that since we only have fermions in the adjoint representation, the center of the group SUN does not act on any of the fields in the Lagrangian. So there is a ZN symmetry, which uh, sometimes people call the center symmetry, 
but it's more in general to think about it as a one-form symmetry using the terminology of these papers. So this model has a Zn symmetry that we will exploit. We can similarly try to gauge this one-form symmetry, this Zn symmetry. This is not a standard global symmetry, it acts on Wilson lines. So to gauge the symmetry, we need to couple uh, the theory to a two-form gauge field, B, which is actually a discrete gauge field. So it's a Zn valued gauge field, uh, two-form gauge field living on three-dimensional space. And you can ask the following question. Suppose you couple the theory to such a two-form gauge field, a Zn gauge field. Uh, is the partition function a function only of the cohomology class of this two-form gauge field, or does it actually, de or does it depend uh, perhaps on the gauge choice? That's the same as asking is the, whether this center, center, center of the gauge group can be gauged, whether we can gauge the one-form symmetry. So we can ask this question. And to understand uh, the math mathematical formalism behind this question, we need to think about what are the possible anomalies of such a one-form symmetry. And for that, you need to classify, uh, as usual in the anomaly inflow uh, formalism, to understand the possible uh, anomaly that this one-form symmetry could attain, it's important to classify actually four-dimensional local integrals of this two-form gauge field. So when you, when you study anomalies, uh, you can think about them as either obstructions to gauging, or you can think about them as local terms in one dimension higher through the anomaly inflow formalism or the SPT formalism in condensed matter physics. So this is, uh, this is, so basically you need to classify such local terms. You need to understand what coefficients you can put in front. And uh, long story short, the answer for spin manifolds, which is all we're going to be interested in, since our theory has fermions, is that the anomaly can take any value between zero and n minus one. So the anomaly is defined mod n. So the thing that you need to remember is that this one, a Zn one-form symmetry in theories with spinners uh, takes values between zero and n minus one. So it's defined mod n. And then you can compute it in this model. This is what it is. And as you remember, this combination is an integer by the consistency condition that I mentioned in the beginning. So the theory that we're discussing uh, has a time reversal symmetry at k equals zero, which has an anomaly, but it also has a one-form symmetry, a centered symmetry, which also has an anomaly. <clears throat> it, would be, it would be important to keep in mind uh, one example of this one-form symmetry anomaly, which is just a pure SUN level M churn Simon theory. That theory also has a Zn symmetry, one-form symmetry, and the anomaly is just M mod N, where M is a subscript of the SUN here. And there are many other TQFTs with similar one-form symmetries, and you can try to study their anomalies. So what did we do so far? Let me just summarize. We outlined the main problem, which is to try to solve QCD with an adjoint fermion without supersymmetry. And we made two preliminary observations that will be crucial as we keep going. The first one is when this model has vanishing churn Simons level K and vanishing mass, the model has a time reversal symmetry and it has a certain anomaly. So it cannot be studied on non-orientable spaces. And the second fact, which is uh, what I just explained, that this model also has a center symmetry or a one-form symmetry, and it also suffers from a certain anomaly. So whatever proposal for the infrared wave function that we're going to make, it has to obey these two constraints. So this, these constraints are interesting, but it's kind of not enough. We need to be more inspired to make, to, to make a guess. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is to describe various weak coupling limits of this model, like large mass, uh, small coupling. We'll describe various uh, interesting weak coupling limits and try to build the phase diagram. And at some point, we'll be ready to make a guess, some points. And these anomalies will be merely just a consistency checks for the guess that we make eventually. So now I'm going to describe some weak coupling limits of these models. One obvious weak coupling limit is when the quarks are extremely heavy. So when these adjoint quarks are extremely heavy, they are not going to participate in the dynamics very much, obviously, and you can just integrate them out. But in two plus one dimensions, integrating out heavy quarks is not a straightforward procedure. As has been pointed out in the 80s by uh, Redleaf and Yemi and Zemenov, 
there is a non-decoupling phenomenon whereby if you integrate out a massive heavy fermion, it actually shifts the churn Simons level by some quantized amount. So when we integrate out these heavy fermions, the effective churn Simons level needs to be shifted by a quantity which is either plus n over 2 or minus n over 2, depending on whether this mass is huge and positive or huge and negative. So when the mass is very large and positive, we integrate out the quarks, we shift the churn Simons level, and we get a pure TQFT. This is, a, this is already the pure TQFT for infrared. But for large negative mass, we get a different TQFT with a different uh, subscript. That, that, that implies that there must be a phase transition as we change the mass. So that's the first lesson. This theory uh, should have some conformal field theory or some kind of phase, maybe a first order phase transition as we change the mass, even at zero temperature, simply because of the fact that we encounter two different topological field theories in the weak coupling limits of this theory. But these two topological field theories have exactly the same one for symmetry and exactly the same one for symmetry anomaly which is, of course, uh, necessary. Otherwise, there would be a contradiction in the picture. So there must be some uh, sort of phase transition. But this conformal field theory that we're going to encounter cannot be of the landau ginzburg type because uh, it has to implement a, a certain transformation of the churn simons of the churn simons theories in the infrared. So it cannot just be a theory of scalars and fermions. It has to have Next, the next weak coupling limit which is also going to be very important, is a little bit less intuitive, but it, it's the following thing. So if the churn Simons level is very large, the theory also becomes weakly coupled. So you don't need the mass to be very large. It's enough that the churn Simons term is very large. The churn Simons uh, coefficient is very large. That's enough to drive the theory into a weakly coupled phase. And the intuitive reason for that is that if the churn Simons level is very large, the gauge field in fact, decouple before the interactions set in. So the interactions set in at the Hooft scale, but the gauge fields have the following mass. So they just decouple even before the interactions set in, and therefore the theory is weakly coupled. So how to make it mathematically more precise? So mathematically, you integrate out the gauge fields because they are very heavy. And then the infrared is actually described by uh, fermions coupled to a pure churn Simons term and there is no gauge kinetic term anymore. And the effective coupling in this theory is 1 over square root of k. So if k is very large, indeed, the fermion interactions are very small. They are only addressed by churn simons interactions, and the gauge interactions, the actual gauge interactions disappear. So <clears throat> to summarize, there are two weak coupling limits, namely large k and large m. And they lead to various interesting conclusions, such as we can this lead in, in the limit of large K, we get the churn simons matter conformal field theory. Uh, in the li limit of, of large M, we get a certain TQFT, and we learn that there must be a phase transition at any K. So we'll summarize all these observations in diagrams. The second observation that will be important comes from uh, accidental supersymmetry. So this theory has, a, for a particular choice of the mass of this adjoint fermion, this theory describes basically a vector multiplet of n equals 1 supersymmetry, a single vector multiplet. And uh, then you can compute the index, namely the number of ground states, of supersymmetry preserving ground states in this theory, which was done by uh, Witten uh, in, the two, in the early 2000s. And what uh, Witten has found is that if k is bigger than n over 2, the index is non-matching, so there are many ground states typically. And in fact, it's consistent to assume that the ground states just support this TQFT, which is what we found for large negative mass. However, sorry, there is a typo. If k is smaller than n over 2, so this should be n over 2, the supersymmetry is expected to be dynamically broken, and there are no ground states uh, which are supersymmetric. So supersymmetry, accidental supersymmetry, teaches us a little bit about the phase diagram of this model, because it tells you something about this part one particular point in the phase diagram where the mass is equal to minus k. So let's summarize it in the picture. The first picture is uh, basically the obvious one, when k is large, and from this computation of the index, 
we have now a prejudice of how large k needs to be for the theory to be in the simple uh, wiki coupled phase, which is analogous to the conformal phase of QCD in three plus one dimensions. So the idea is that we can determine in some sense the conformal window of this theory exactly. So for k bigger than n over two, uh, one is led to the following phase diagram. Let me explain it in detail. So sometimes we call this phase the large k phase. That's the weakly coupled phase, which is uh, very similar to the conformal phase of QCD. So in this phase, uh, you, if the mass is large and negative, you encounter a TQFT. And one particular point on that uh, half line is the point where there is n equals 1 supersymmetry. Namely, this is the point with accidental n equals 1 supersymmetry. And basically, it's just sitting here. And it's consistent with the Witten index. So the computation of the Witten index is very, is remarkably consistent with semi-classical analysis in this, in this case. Then there is a certain conformal field theory uh, whose construction I outlined. It can be viewed as a churn simon symmetric theory. And we can compute the scaling of exponents in the subject function 1 over k. It's rather easy. And finally, when the mass is large, uh, there is a different TQFT. So this phase diagram is very simple. There are two TQFTs and a conformal filter that renders a transition between them. And that's it. And you can, so you can run a lot of consistency checks on this picture. So this picture is really a commitment. Uh, it's not uh, an op because we're really committing that that's the case for k bigger than n over 2. With, so we're really committing where the conformal window ends in some sense in this theory. So one has to run a lot of consistency checks. So here I just uh, gave two examples of consistency checks. There are many others. I won't cover them all. And also I won't cover this one in detail. But the idea is basically that for SO2 gauge theory, an I joint fermion is the same as a fundamental fermion for SO3. So the idea is that you can try to gauge some one-form symmetries and try to compare these to the phases that were recently discussed, discussed for SO3 gauge theories coupled to fermions. And in the end of the day, what, fi what one finds is a completely consistent picture. And as a, as a bonus, uh, these conformal field theories that we encountered sometimes have a nice dual description in terms of some O to, let's say, X in the XY universality class or in the Eisen universality class. So if you take uh, n equals 2, so you're setting SU2 gauge theory coupled to a fermion in the adjoint representation at level 3, where 3 is bigger than 1, you find uh, in something in the universality class of the XY model. And if you take k to be uh, 1, and then you find something in the Ising universality class, these are testable predictions that uh, perhaps uh, can be checked sort. But now let's get to the interesting problem. This is the analog of the you know, confining phase or chiral symmetry breaking phase in four dimensions, where one really needs to make a leap, where semi-classics and uh, simple uh, guesses cannot be sufficient. So we're asking, what if k is small? So the theory is really strongly coupled. k is smaller than n over 2, and perhaps even vanishing. So that's the time reversal invariant theory. And we already know a little bit about the phase diagram. So the picture here is supposed to outline what we currently know. So we know that there is a TQFT very far away here. There is a TQFT very far away on the other side, where this axis is the mass axis, as before. And we don't know what happens inside. Okay, there is a big blob. That's where the theory is genuinely strongly coupled. And we don't know what's going on, except that we know that there is some, you know, one point where, is a, where there is accidental supersymmetry that is dynamically broken. And as you remember, when supersymmetry is dynamically broken, there is a massless fermion. So there is a gold zero particle sitting here. So that clear, the fact that there is a gold zero particle here clearly shows that the, this is more complicated. This must be more complicated than the previous thing that we found, because there isn't any massless fermion here. It's just a TQFT. So the main challenge is now to, under, to, to try to come up with a certain picture for the quantum behavior of this in the strongly coupled regime, obeying these various consistency conditions. <clears throat> and miraculously, uh, the following conjecture passes all the tests that we could think of. Uh, and I'll explain how this conjecture passes all the tests that, uh, uh, I, that, that have to do with these anomalies and various additional consistency checks. So the conjecture is that 
there is a new phase of this uh, QCD3, adjoint QCD3, where you encounter a new Q TQFT not based on an SU group. So this is a TQFT based on the group U. So you don't, this, this cannot arise semi-classically. It's a TQFT based on a completely different, on a different gauge group. And the rank of this gauge group is also different. It has some levels. And then there is a Goldstein particle that sits here. So the picture is that there is a whole range of the mass parameter separated by two conformal field theories from the semi-classical asymptotic phases, where there is a new TQFT, and in addition, there is a special point where there is a new massless fermion. So how do you uh, check this picture? You need, to, you need to apply various consistency checks to this picture, and now we'll go one by one, and you'll see how miraculously all the consistency checks work with just this one simple proposal. So, let's uh, start with the one-form symmetry. So, as you will soon see, this uh, TQFT that we propose exists in this quantum phase, uh, has, a, has a ZN one-form symmetry, and it can be checked that it has the right anomaly under it for this one-form symmetry. Now, time reversal symmetry, which is uh, related to the talk of my sum, uh, works very nicely, because when you plug k equals zero into this picture, you just take this picture, you plug k equals to zero, you find a certain TQFT, and miraculously this TQFT is time reversal invariant. So that's a necessary condition for, uh, for, for this picture to make any sense. So we can even ask whether the time reversal anomaly, uh, this three and minus one new anomaly that we mentioned before, whether it is mismatched by this uh, conjecture. So we have to study in detail this time reversal invariant spin TQFT, and we have to understand what happens to this chart Simon's theory when we study it on a non-orientable space. There has been a lot of literature on this, including some work that we have done, uh, and it's related to my sum stock, and the final answer is the following. This comes from a completely different uh, literature, uh, somewhat orthogonal to, you know, uh, the questions of QCD dynamics, and this is the answer. So it's plus minus two depending on whether n is divisible by two, uh, sorry, divisible by four with uh, residue two or divisible by four with residue zero. And now what you do is you take this answer, you combine it with the single massless Majorana fermion that is associated to supersymmetry breaking at k equals to zero, and you sum them up and you exactly find the answer that we had before, three and minus one mod 16 depending on whether n is 2 mod 4 or 0 mod 4. This is a small miracle uh, that shows that this conjecture is not completely crazy. It reproduces the time reversal anomaly of the ultra bad. <clears throat> now you can ask, what about the one-form anomaly? I haven't yet explained why the one-form anomaly works. One-form symmetry anomaly. So, in fact, uh, there is a small detour that I want, I want to go back to this picture and discuss a little bit uh, the conformal field theories that separate this new quantum phase from the asymptotic classical phases, semi-classical phases. So we actually claim that this new conformal field, that these conformal field theories have dual description given by a, a different gauge theory with a new fermion that is non locally related to the original fermion. And that so the dual description involves uh, a gauge group with this rank coupled to a new fermion that is also in the adjoint representation, but it's not related to the original fermion, at least not in any local way. So this is a new adjoint, adjoint fermion, fermion duality. It's a different, it's different conceptually from uh, the other chart samples, so other dualities, uh, since, well, it has this one form symmetry and it's a fermion, fermion duality. But the existence of this dual description can, is, is something that you can use to easily check that the one-form symmetry anomaly matches. Because in this dual description, uh, the quantum phase that we had here uh, is actually semi-classically visible. So in terms of the dual description, this phase is easy. It's a semi-classical phase. So therefore, the anomaly works. Okay, so we can even take an example. This is an example that people could easily run on the lattice uh, and check this conjecture. So we take, for example, SU2 gauge theory coupled to a Majorana fermion in the adjoint representation. This theory is time reversal invariant. 
we take k equals zero, n equals zero, it's straightforward to put it on the lattice. Time reversal symmetry will be accidental, but that's uh, the usual story. We claim that the infrared is described by the semion churn simon smether theory, coupled to a massless fermion. So this passes all the consistency checks. And in fact, somewhat surprisingly, uh, this conjecture that we made implies that these models are not confined. This is somewhat surprising, but in particular, it implies that at k equals zero, when this model is time reversal invariant, it cannot be confined. Because there is this churn simon theory that describes the braiding of the original Wilson lines. So in particular, in the SESI-2 gauge theory, the original Wilson line is mapped to the spin four and spin a quarter anion in this infrared description. So it has non-trivial braiding and it cannot have area law as a result. Okay, so this finishes the proposed uh, descri this description, a uh, brief description of the proposed uh, infrared dynamics of uh, adjoint PCB in two plus one dimension. And now I want to mention some tantalizing uh, connection to 4D young mills dynamics. And in particular, you will see that this approach allows to solve a few, a few uh, problems about 4D young mills theory that have been open for quite a while. So first, I want to review some basic properties of a young mills theory in four dimensions, super young mills theory in four dimensions. And then you'll see that there is a tantalizing connection to some aspects of the 3D story that we were discussing. So four-dimensional super young mills theory with gauge group SUN has n ground states, as has been known for several decades. And it is interesting to consider domain walls connecting the ground states I and J. So what do we know about the domain wall which would connect the ground state I and J? We know that, it, that the domain wall theory can only depend on the difference between I and J mod N because there is a chiral symmetry that allows you to uh, shift i and j simultaneously by any integer. But then there is also time reversal symmetry in four dimensions, which relates the vacuum i to the vacuum n minus i plus two, and the vacuum j to the vacuum n minus j plus two. So this wall between i and j has to be related to this wall up to a time reversal symmetry. <coughs> so this is a picture. Let's say we have SU6. As you see, the gauge theory has uh, six ground states, and we can consider, let's say, the domain wall connecting ground state number one and ground state number three. So each of these vacua is trivially gapped in the, in the terminology of the first slide, but the domain wall theory would be non-trivial. So in particular, if n is even, such as in this SU6 example, the wall between uh, the first vacuum and the vacuum n over two plus one is related to itself uh, by time reversal symmetry that we explained before, and it has time reversal invariance. So you see already some analogy with this two plus one dimensional story that in this S6 gauge theory, the wall that's connecting one and four is kind of invariant under reflection, and so that leads to a time reversal symmetry in two plus one dimensions. So Achari and Vafa have uh, considered the question of what is the theory that is supported on this domain wall uh, many years ago, and they have come up with this proposal that if you, the, your wall jumps over I vacua, then this is the TQT that it supports. And this conjecture passes many interesting tests, including brain constructions, indices, and, and various other things. So this is a very interesting conjecture, but it's, in our context, it's very interesting to observe that the quantum phases of the 3D model that we discussed just in the context of three-dimensional QCD. Let me remind you. So we found a new quantum phase in three-dimensional non-supersymmetric QCD, which was uh, this thing. So it's interesting to observe that this quantum phase is very much reminiscent of the acharya Vafa conjecture. Sorry, this is the acharya Vafa conjecture. So in fact, the fact that these two con that these two different problems lead to a similar answer is not surprising uh, in hindsight. It's because they have the same anomalies. So you, these two constructions lead to a three-dimensional theory on the wall, a three-dimensional theory. In one case, it's a theory on some wall. In the other case, it's just a microscopically, cons microscopically consistent three-dimensional theory, but they have exactly the same anomalies. So it's not entirely surprising that they end up being in the same phase. 
So this, 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 agree, this agreement is not entirely accidental. <clears throat> but using this uh, stuff, we can now continue to, we, we, can now, we can now try to generalize beyond SUF gauge theory. And we can try to identify the theories on domain walls in other four dimensional gauge theories. So now we'll discuss super young mill theory with other simply connected gauge groups in four dimensions. And using these ideas from three dimensions, where we have a quantum phase, a dual description, using a new fermion fermion duality, we will try to construct uh, the solution of this, the solution for the domain wall theory with other gauge groups, not necessarily SUN. This is something that uh, many people have tried, but it has been resistant to other approaches. While this approach leads to a concrete answer that seems perfectly correct. So let's start from uh, n, n equals 1 super young mills theory with gauge group SPN. It has n plus 1 trivially gap to Bakwa, and one can again consider a domain wall that hops over I Bakwa. And this is, what we, this is our proposal for the theory on the wall. This, obeys, it, this theory obeys this uh, duality, which is the same as saying that the wall from 1 to I is the same as the wall from you know, 1 to n minus I minus 1. Sorry, n minus i plus 1. So this, this, th this proposal immediately passes the consistency check the time reversal symmetry acts, co acts correctly. You can even check the time reversal anomaly. Everything seems to be perfect. So you can try to compare the time reversal anomaly for the case that n is odd. It works perfectly. So <clears throat> similarly, you can try to discuss n equals 1 super young mills theory with, another, with the simply connected group spin n. It has n minus 2 trivial gap to back 1, and one can again ask what is the theory on the wall. This is again something that people have tried with other approaches uh, unsuccessfully. So you can also ask the same question about SON gauge theory, but SON is harder for a reason that I'll explain soon. So this is the proposal. This proposal looks a little bit more exotic than the previous one, and indeed it's not easy to guess. Uh, but our proposal for the theory on this wall is an O churn Simon's theory at level one with some funny levels. So this superscript one indicates that there are two types of O gauge theories in three dimensions. Uh, what the distinction between the two is whether or not you add this term to the Lagrangian, and this term intuitively couples the Z2 uh, subgroup of the O group to the SO gauge field or not. So one indicates that you need to add such coupling, and these are the levels of the SO and the Z2, respectively. So this is a certain uh, Chern Simons theory about which, in principle, everything is known. And this is what we propose to be the theory on the wall uh, for a four-dimensional gauge theory with the gauge group spin. And the level rank duality can again be seen to apply. There is a level rank duality for these funny gauge groups. And this exactly reflects the four-dimensional uh, constraints on domain walls that follow from level from, from time reversal symmetry. And again, the anomalies seem to match perfectly. You can, you can also apply this technology for studying the domain wall theories in four-dimensional Young Mills theories with uh, meta representations which are not, not, not those of super Young Mills theory. So, for instance, we can study SPN gauge theory coupled to a massless wild fermion in the anti-symmetric representation, or spin and gauge theory coupled to a symmetric wild fermion, and you can produce similar conjectures for the domain wall theories in the, in the, for those four-dimensional gauge theories. So, uh, to, to conclude, uh, <clears throat> we see that discrete anomalies that are associated to this one-form symmetries, time reversal symmetries, are actually extremely powerful. They constrain the dynamics of gauge theories in two plus one dimensions very, very severely. And the same is also true for gauge theories in one plus one and three plus one dimensions, but it's not something that I've discussed here. And there is a lot of recent work on such ideas, including many people in the audience. <coughs> now, what we have done here, mostly, is to come up with a proposed solution for two plus one dimensional QCD. So we have a we have a proposal for a phase diagram that includes a new quantum phase and a new duality. And uh, some of these ideas can certainly be tested on the lattice phase. So, for example, the answer that we have uh, proposed for SCP gauge theory should certainly be soon testable. Then we use 
use this, uh, we use this uh, new ideas about three-dimensional dynamics to make a proposal for the domain wall theories in young Mills theory in three plus one dimensions. Since these two problems uh, require some, you know, in the end have the same anomalies and the same symmetries, it sort of makes sense that uh, the that observations on the first would be useful for the second problem. And indeed, this allowed us to come up with a suggestions for the domain wall theories in SPN gauge theories and spin gauge theories in four dimensions, generalizing the Charya Vafa to other simply connected groups. And as I said, this, this has been a somewhat of a thorny question that has resisted other approaches. Let me make a brief comment about SON, which I promised. So spin N, uh, since spin N is simply connected, the following is true. So when you study spin N, super young industry, it has a similar picture. There are some vacua, which are trivially gapped, and it makes sense to ask about domain wall theories. But for SON gauge theories, some of the vacua in the bulk are not trivially gapped. So the, there is a topological filter already in the bulk in four dimensions, and therefore the theory that lives on the wall is not in fact a three-dimensional theory per se. Uh, and the discussion becomes a little bit more technical, and it's more a case-by-case -case analysis. So from what I said, you can infer the answer for SON, but it's not as nice. But you, it's just a note, note that the answers for spin N are known. Uh, SON is uh, just a matter of uh, gauging some discrete subgroups. Uh, but you don't get as nice answers uh, as for spin N since some of the vacua in the bulk are not trivial. So there are lots of open questions. Here I just discussed the dynamics of QCD coupled to a single Majorana fermion in the adjoint which is in some sense the minimal model. <clears throat> but you can ask, what about models where, where there are more Majorana fermions? Uh, do, do, does the symmetry break, for example, the flavor symmetry that rotates these Majorana fermions? What about non-simply connected groups? As I mentioned, this is in principle doable, but it's a more case-by-case -case analysis. Are there simply connected subgroups? What about the domain walls in uh, n equals one star? So one can ask similar questions about other systems. And finally, since uh, there has been a lot of work on these Acharya Vafa theories using brain constructions, now that there are these uh, very concrete conjectures for the domain wall theories for spin n and sp, it might be worthwhile to revisit these brain constructions and see if the same answers can be obtained using brain constructions. So there is some recent relevant work by uh, these authors and perhaps others. Uh, thanks very much.